All right, good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We haven't seen each other since last year, as the old thing goes. It's good to see you. To those who are in the fellowship hall, we did open up the overflow room this morning. Um, and to those of you who are watching at home, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're here together on this street corner uh, to give our hearts and minds to Jesus. And that's what worship is all about, the way we sing, our prayer, our Bible set, our fellowship. So it's good you're here. Now, I need to go to uh, a couple of things. If you're a guest of ours, we'd love to know it. If you've never registered as a guest, you can use the QR code uh, that I think is on the back of the uh, visitor's card or the uh, 
VIP cards that are in the, the pews, fill that out. The card itself, you can drop it in the offering basket on your way out. Just a lot of different ways. Just want to know who you are. Not going to flood you with information or anything like that. Uh, but that'd be good. So, some things you got to talk about real quick. This is the not as fun part of worship, okay? Number one, um, there's a lot of, I say a lot, uh, there's a good bit of chatter about COVID. I don't know if y'all know that or not. And the word Omicron, which makes it sound so frightful, like a, uh, you know, like a transformer coming after us. Um, yes, uh, it, is, it is contagious. Yeah, there are some people that uh, have gotten it. <clears throat> a lot of people um, heard this morning that uh, two of our students who had gone on the snow trip had tested positive for that. Just trying to cover all those bases. We're aware of it. Okay, now, um, as it relates to our church, okay, first thing is, at least right as of today, uh, there's not going to be any kind of change in scheduling or anything like that. We did open up the overflow room just for those who might not want to be as in an enclosed area. That's okay, and um, we're in here. But as far as schedule changing, we're, 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 we're full blast uh, today. Um, We've been at this long enough now. COVID has lived with us for almost two years, it seems like. Well, it has been almost two years. And so we've learned. we learned the things that are good to do. And really, they're good to do all the time. And not even when uh, a variant has reared its uh, head among us. Things like using hand sanitizer, which is all over the church. You know, if you want to fist bump somebody instead of shaking their hand. If you want to hold back on the holy hugs, you know, that's good. Respect people's personal bubbles. That's a good thing. Um, so I brought this. I just wanted you to see. This is one of the coolest gadgets. Gadgets. <laughs> we use this every week around here to sanitize our Sunday school rooms, pews. Load that baby up right there with Omicron killing juice. <laughs> Not for real. It's great. Well, you just you just go on. And so if it gets any worse, we're just going to start doing it while y'all are in the pews. And so we're going to get. We're going to get the pews. So we go through our Sunday school classes, through our, our worship areas, and we've been doing that for years. This is not a new thing. Just We're doing all that we can to be wise in terms of how we respond to this uh, without, without responding um, in fear or uh, anything like that. As always, you know, if you're feeling bad, maybe a little fever, sick, not sure, stay home. That's true all the time. Our nursery workers, uh, if, if Ryan was in here, he would tell you, you know, if, you're, if your baby's not feeling well, stay home and take care of that baby. Uh, not, you know, it's, it's just a, a wise thing to do. Um, that's one of the great things about our online ministry. Uh, you can still join us uh, right there online, live, on Sunday mornings. I want to encourage you to attend to your physical health. Take care of yourself. Eat well. Get some exercise. You need to get your heart rate up for at least 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes every day, okay? Walking, running, climbing trees, whatever it is you want to choose to do. Get outside. Get some fresh air in there. I mean, it's spring, right? <laughs> yeah. I was, I was outside in shorts and T-shirt working in the yard yesterday. Anybody else? I mean, it's just, you know, you know, get outside. And I think this is maybe even more important than guarding and attending to your physical health, although that's very important. I really want to encourage you to guard your heart during all this stuff that's, that's going on, not just this Omicron variant, but just over this past two years, um, it is so easy for negative things to take root in our heart. Anger, frustration, bitterness, whatever it might be, a sense of, um, uh, of helplessness and you know, and, and a loss of control. Scripture tells us to set our mind on things above, to really focus your heart on who Christ is and the hope that he brings. We just came out of the season or coming out of the season of Advent, talking about hope and peace and love and joy. Really set your mind on those things which come to us through that relationship we have with Christ and, um, and go forward. So full ministry schedule today as far as any of our afternoon or evening uh, gatherings, Awana, um, Bible drills, small groups, so forth and so on. And then here's the thing I want to remind you of. Next Sunday, for the first time in almost two years, not quite, but almost two years, 
we will go back to our dual service Sunday morning schedule. That's next Sunday. This is coming up Sunday, seven days from today. 8.30 service in the fellowship hall. 9.45 Sunday school. 11 o'clock service right here in the sanctuary. And um, so you plug in whatever worship service or both if you, if you want to. Sunday school, small groups, man, you need a small group to build a relationship in. But that starts next Sunday morning uh, at 8.30. And, of course, this Wednesday night coming up, three days from now, our regular Wednesday night uh, schedule of events, uh, all of our children's ministries, our student ministries, Wednesday night supper starts back, adult choir practice starts back, and uh, adult Bible study as well. So there you go. We're kind of going uh, full tilt uh, straight into this new year. We do it with a prayerful heart, with a heart that's trusting God, and um, that's a good thing. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you chose to be on this street corner, in this room, the other room, or on this street corner uh, virtually by uh, by the wonder of the cyber world. And so now we bring our hearts to... Uh, to worship in song and in fellowship and in prayer and in Bible study. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you. We love you. Uh, we thank you for loving us. <coughs> Father, it is only because of Jesus that we can call you Father and, and know that you hear us and know our name. We, we, we're, in, we're coming out of this Christmas celebration so much aware that Christ is the reason for our hope. Christ is the reason for our joy, for our peace. Christ shows us your incredible love. And so as we worship today, Father, speak to us by your Holy Spirit. We want to just quiet ourselves in your presence. This isn't about us this time. This, this time is about you and, 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 and our willingness to lift you up and our bringing of ourselves as an offering to you. So quiet by your Holy Spirit, our hearts, our minds, Draw us to yourself, pour into us in that way you do. And uh, Father, we, we just want to tell you we, we love you today. And it's in the strong name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we have said that we are going to continue with our Christmas celebration because Christmas isn't over. over. Today is the ninth day of Christmas, so I'm going to invite nine ladies to come and join us here on the uh, to dance while we uh, sing. Or you could uh, c consider the nine gifts of the Spirit uh, as we continue our worship this morning. But one of the things we want to continue to remember, not only in the Christmas season, uh, but also throughout the year, is that we are invited to come. We have been called into this place because our God wants to celebrate and commune with us. Would you stand together as we sing together, O come, all ye faithful.
time, it is a season that we celebrate birthdays. My birthday in the, it was in this season also. But we continue to celebrate the most important birthday of all, the birthday of our king. continue our worship. There are Christmas songs from all around the world, from France, from Germany, I think we're most familiar with. But this one is one of my favorites. It is from Poland. It originally started as a lullaby, and as Christianity spread through the area, words were added to remind us of the, the perhaps something of the lullaby that Mary may have sung with her baby. Infant holy, infant lowly.
continue in that same thought of that quiet night, would you stand together as we sing Silent Night, Holy Night? There is a song that seems to be a perennial favorite. The composer is a French uh, mystic, uh, a French uh, writer um, who applied some of, the, some of the meaning of Christ's birth to his contemporary situation, and, but it reminds us all of the difficulties that the world is in and of the gift that Christ came to bring to us from God the Father. Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our tears, Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. 
rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, ye the angel voices, O oh, no. was born, born nine, divine, born night, born night, divine. Led by the light of faith serenely beaming with glowing hearts by his cradle we stand led by the light of a star Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus.
So, Dana reminded us that today is the ninth of the 12 days of Christmas, the nine ladies dancing, which would have been good. I didn't see any takers on your invitation, though. Um, I can remember way back learning the 12 days of Christmas song, who knows what comes after nine ladies dancing, eight. Yeah, y'all know it too, Major Milky. I was always, okay, so, so like the 12 days of Christmas, does that start on the 13th of, you know, December? I, what's the case here? But it really doesn't. The 12 days of Christmas begins on December 25th and extends through what is called Epiphany in January, which is tied together with um, the manifestation of the Christ child to the Gentiles in the form of the Magi, the wise men that came to see. And so the first of those days of Christmas, on Christmas Day, and then the, the gifts of, of Christmas all the way up through what's called the Twelfth Night, which is just before uh, the celebration of the Epiphany of Christ, the revelation of God in the flesh, not just to the Jewish people, but to the whole world. And of course, we understand that even more so now in light of the cross and uh, the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, and then how the church was, was spread out among the world and the gospel was taken to all people. The Bible says, whosoever will may come to all who call on him, um, <clears throat> which is great. So it's also called, Epiphany is also called Three Kings Day. Uh, which is not, you know, we don't really know that there were just three kings, but you know how that works. We three kings from Orient are. So it's kind of a cool thing, but the, the truth is, for a lot of us, I would guess, both in this room and the other room and even watching online, I would guess that for many people already, we've packed Christmas up and put it away. Am I right about that? How many of you have already packed it all up? How many of you started doing that the day after Christmas? Yeah? How many of you waited one or two days, but you said, we just got to get this done before we go back to work and everything? Yeah, okay. We took down our Christmas tree yesterday. I had to beg and plead, but Gail allowed our Christmas tree to stay up through yesterday. I did. It's just such a beautiful thing, and it's, 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 I, I just enjoy it. And, and one of the things I've been thinking about this year is that, you know, sometimes I think that we prepare so much for all the accoutrements of Christmas that once it gets here, we're so tired, we're just ready for it to be done. And then we pack it up, and we move on to whatever is next. I, 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 would, I would even guess that maybe there, there's some in this room or watching online or wherever you may be that might, might even have maybe even a, a, a bit of excitement about a national championship game that's going to take place next Monday night. This kind of replaced your Christmas excitement, you know, uh, this time of year. And, but, but we had talked, and Dane and I had talked, and we wanted to take one last look at, at Christmas. But I want to take a little bit different look, a uh, I, I'm borrowing this from Shane Savannah. I heard him use it one time. It was pretty good. I want us to take a 20,000-foot view of, of Christmas, okay? And I want us to pull some things out of that that we just need to remember, you know, all the way between now and the next time we're going into our storage building or our attic and pulling out all these decorations and the things that we uh, put up and, 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 and get ready for our Christmas celebration. So if you have your Bible... Um, we're going to read a fairly familiar passage, two actually, uh, from two different Gospels, one from Luke and one from Matthew. So uh, if you want to get your, your scripture out and follow along, we're going to start in Luke chapter 2, verse 15, because these are very familiar to us. We're not going to, we're not going to read the full context because we know the context, but I, but I want to set it a little bit differently as we get through reading these. So Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. And when the angels had left them, that them being the shepherds, when the angels had left the shepherds and gone into heaven, this is after their incredible invitation to come and see what's happened, the shepherds said to one another, let's go, let's go to Bethlehem, see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and they found Mary and they found Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. A part of their amazement had to do with the fact that it was the shepherds who were the news bearers of such an incredible event. 
And then in Matthew chapter 2, i uh, just going to bring this in. It's, it's, it's not happening at the same time as the shepherds, although many of our nativity scenes show it that way. But a bit later, Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, when they saw the star, and now we're talking about the magi, the wise men. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They've been on this incredible journey, you know, that, that we don't even know the origins of their journey, really. What ancient texts and texts of antiquity they had read and studied and what astrological charts they... It's just amazing, and, but, but they know that something is going on, and they saw the star, they were overjoyed, the star that had been leading them. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures, presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Okay, so I, I, want us, I, want us to take, I want us to take the 20,000-foot view of, of, of the tableau of that first Christmas. This, this animal room, this cave, this stable, what, you know, out here, out here, I have behind me, you know, we can see this. I don't know if you ever see it, whoever's watching, but, you know, this is kind of how we represented a lot of times, you know, the baby in the manger and, and the animals and the angel and the wise men and the shepherds. And I want you to, if you can, like you see on TV sometimes now, uh, you know, where they'll show something in 3D and you can just kind of look at the big picture of it, you know, as it goes around almost, you know, like you can, you know, kind of like Iron Man does with his stuff, you know, when he reaches in there and, and puts stuff together. I want you to think about just that tableau, that picture In Bethlehem, containing Mary and Joseph. It's not going to be quite biblically accurate because I want you to picture the wise men in there with the shepherds. Mary and Joseph, a baby, a star, shepherds, wise men. And, of course, we know about the angelic um, crowd that was watching this that appeared to the, to the shepherds. I want you to think about that. And, and, and kind of what I did this week, I said, okay, just looking at that, just looking at that picture, if you could freeze frame it, that picture, the stable, the manger, if there were other animals there, wise men, shepherd, angels. What, what are some truths that we need to be reminded of, that we can be reminded of just from looking at that? And uh, these are things that I think the church, whether it be First Baptist Church on this street corner or any group of believers that meets anywhere, four things we need to remember from just looking at this right here, that tableau of God in the flesh in a manger, Mary, Joseph, shepherds, wise men. First thing I think we need to remember, really need to focus on it, the good news of Jesus is for all people. It's for everybody. You look at Mary, you look at Joseph, you look at the shepherds, you look at the Magi, and you see rich, and you see poor, and you see young, and you see older, and you see educated, and you see uneducated. There, right there, right there, in that tableau of the nativity, you see a cross-section of all of humanity and all were at this point where Christ came in the flesh, where God came to walk among us. The good news of Jesus is for all people. And we, we should strive. And when I say we, I mean First Baptist Church on this street corner. We should make it like a goal to be a church of shepherds and wise men. A church where all who seek Jesus are welcome. Are welcome. But we have to work at that because it doesn't come natural to us. I mean, if we're honest, we're kind of cliquish. I don't mean just first magisters. I mean human, human nature. We're kind of cliquish. Go to the high school cafeteria. You can, am I telling the truth? You can pick out who's who, what group they belong to by where they're sitting because we tend to, 
Well, I'll sit together and, and even within a, a church, this one or any other, we tend to, to, to have social groups and, and networking with a smaller group within the larger group of the church. And, and, and we have to be really careful that we don't just consider people who look like us and smell like us and think like us and, 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 and wear the same things as us as being the kind of people that we need to reach out to. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is for everybody, everybody. No matter what their skin color is, no matter what their financial situation is, their socioeconomic standing, their last name, any of those things. I want to be a church. I want to be a church where if you're looking for Jesus, this is the place to be. If you want to see what Jesus followers act like, this is a good place to be. We're not perfect. We're trying to figure it out. We're walking in grace. It broke my heart a little bit, and, 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 and it wasn't done in a bad way and whatsoever, but on the inside, I was, my heart just cracked a little bit. Anytime something like this happens, we were having the uh, Christmas Eve, well, it wasn't Christmas Eve, it was the Wednesday night before Christmas uh, communion service over here, and people were coming in and gathering, and you know, I was watching, and as we came in the door, there were people coming in like really dressed up in their Christmas best, you know, a lot of red and green and gold stuff coming in. And then there were other people coming in in their shorts and their T-shirts on. And I'm kind of like, this is so cool. I like this. This is the way it ought to be. All people come together. I don't think the shepherds dressed up to come see Jesus in that nativity. I think the wise men were already dressed up, so it really didn't have anything to do with Jesus when they came to the nativity. But there, there was a family that came in. I was standing there talking to the family and I said, man, it's good to see y'all here now. Y'all going to come in and join us? And, and, and they said, I don't, I don't know. I, I, well, I, I'm not sure we're dressed appropriately. And they were just kind of, you know, viewing some that were coming in. They're just really, you know, look, looking, looking good, looking nice. And I told them, I said, what, what are you talking about? There's no dress code. It's a heart code. Do you have a heart to want to worship? We come in here and worship. I don't know. See, we have to work at this. We have to work at being a church where all people sense the presence of Christ. And, and, and we're not so much looking at each other as we're looking at Christ. You know, the whole thing about this, this manger, what? the shepherds weren't looking at each other. The wise men weren't looking at each other. What captivated their attention? Jesus. I'm telling you, when a church is captivated by the presence of Jesus, we don't look at each other nearly as much. We're not nearly as self-conscious. We're not nearly as reserved in our worship when our eyes are on Jesus. The gospel, the gospel, the good news, this is for every, everybody. So that's one thing. Just looking at this, at that tableau, at that, that still life of the nativity, as we see, it's obviously... So many, so many different kinds of people are there. The good news is for all people. So, so the, the challenge for us is, is, is making sure that as we gather on this street corner, we gather in great humility. That we leave our, 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 our pride and our egos outside the door. Really, we just need to let go of them completely. But we're told in Philippians to have the same mind in us, which was also in Christ where he let go of everything in order to be obedient to the Father. And so we come together. We just need to come in humility. You can't fake that. You can't fake humility. That only comes as you grow in Christ and the, the mind of Christ grows in us so that as we're coming together on this street corner, all who come sense this acceptance because we all understand we are sinners in need of a Savior. Second thing I want to say to this, Okay. Number one, the gospel is for all people. Number two, looking at this still life of the nativity, it's Jesus. It's the presence of Jesus that transforms the ordinary into extraordinary. It's the presence of Christ that transforms the worship and ministry of the church. Stop and think about it for a minute. Because of Jesus... Children can't hardly go anywhere and see a wooden manger and not comment on what? Baby Jesus. I mean, you take him to the craft fair, North Georgia, Hawassee, and, they, and look at all the woodworkers, and you'll see these exquisitely crafted wooden mangers. And a child's going to see that and say, 
That's what, that's what Jesus was born in. That's what Jesus laid in. Jesus has brought extraordinary meaning to a really rather ordinary and not very nice setting, a, a, a stable, an animal area, and a manger. Jesus has transformed it into something of enduring glory. Church, we need to remember that our singing, whether it's, whether it's congregational, whether it's choir, whether it's praise team, our instrumentalists, all of our music, our singing and all that goes with it, our teaching, our preaching, our ministry, our organizational structure, all of that, even though it might be humanly excellent, is at its best just ordinary, apart from the presence of Christ, apart from a heart to bring great glory to Christ. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, we're told that absent a heart of love, and of course, a heart of love is a heart that's focused on Christ. Absent a heart of love, then a lot of the things we do just really become what? Loud noise, clanging symbols. Because it's not about what we do, it's about doing what we can as an offering to Christ because Christ is at the center of all that a church does. And we want that to be our goal. Do we always reach that perfectly? No, but man, we're pushing towards that. We're pushing towards that. D.L. Moody tells a story <clears throat> about attending a concert, Christian concert back in the day, different than Christian concerts nowadays, with a friend. And at this concert, Christian concert, there were different singers and one of great renown in, in that era. But there was also an unknown younger female who sang in that same concert. The renowned singer of Christian songs got up and performed a technically powerful song of faith. The younger singer got up and performed well, not technically proficient, but Man, from her heart, she sang. And one of the things that D.L. Moody talked about with his friend on the way home, he said, you know, that well-known singer, that, that was an amazing song, but for some reason, that girl's singing moved me. And his friend, with great wisdom, said, well, it may be because that great, technically proficient singer spoke to this. But that young girl song connected with this. Our heart, our heart for Christ, our, our, our desire for people to see Christ in all we do, to hear the message of Christ in all we do and how we do it, whether it's in a worship service, whether it's in children's ministry, whether it's student ministry, whether it's in committee work, whatever it might be, doing it all for the honor, for the glory of Christ, so that he's the centerpiece of all that we do. Because when Christ is in it, it is transformed into something extraordinary and of eternal value. If you look at the whole nativity setup, we're reminded that simple can be absolutely breathtaking. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be highly decorated. It doesn't have to be anything but focused on Christ just simply for his glory and simple can take your breath away. So a couple, three weeks ago, I was at a Sunday school Christmas party. Anybody go to a Sunday school Christmas party this year? Yeah, I went to one. In this particular Sunday school class, the party that I went to with my wife, they do this thing, it's really kind of a cutthroat thing, but they do this thing where everybody brings a gift. 
And it's the whole deal where, you know, the first person, you draw numbers, and the first person opens a gift, and, and, and whatnot. Well, then the second person opens a gift, and if they don't like theirs, they can trade with the, the one, the first one. And it, it's, it takes forever. You know, and people, I mean, people are, you can see them, they're keeping track of what's where and what they're going after. And there's some, some rules, you know, that, and, and we'll follow them. And so, you know, it's always kind of fun. And I have never, in all my years of going, and we've been doing this for, for a lot of years with this Sunday school class, I've never really received a gift that I felt like I needed to, to protect. You know, I was like, okay, if somebody trades for mine, that's cool, you know. And um, until this year. And I opened mine this year, and I was, I was absolutely struck by the sim- simple beauty of this Christmas ornament. And a part of the beauty was that it was made by a group of extraordinary adults over uh, in, in um, Hawkinsville, uh, in Perry. It's just, it's just really, it was, it was and, and I'm, I made note of it. I said, isn't this incredible? I walked around and showed everybody, isn't this incredible? Okay, so... Guess what? Just a little bit later, somebody who came after me, after they went and opened up their gift, decided they wanted my gift more, and they came and stole it. I mean, took it from me. <laughs> and gave me theirs. I couldn't even tell you what they gave me. I was so distraught in that moment. I told Gail Noel and said, that's the first time ever I wanted the actual gift that I opened. And, and somebody's going to come and be so unchristian and take it from me at Christmas time. And then a really good friend tracked down that ornament and went and bought another one and gave it to me because they could see how much that meant to me. And this was it. Look at that. There's no glitter. There's no flashy colors. But you look at that and you know the truth, don't you? You know what this ornament's about. Simple can be so incredibly beautiful. I think we need to remember that. And most simply, giving our hearts to Christ in all that we do for his glory. Third thing, when you look at this whole nativity and all that that showed up there and that were part of that, I think we need to remember this. Personal invitations are powerful. The shepherds were personally invited to be a part of what was going on there. Somehow or another, the magi got clued into what was going on through the ancient texts and through whatever. But their their invitation was not as direct, but they, they knew this was... There was something going on they needed to be at. They were there. Mary and Joseph responded to the angels who said, this is what's happening. I'm inviting you to be a part of this. And they were a part of it. Powerful, powerful are personal invitations. And and I just want to say to us as a church, to myself and to you, that, that just like shepherds and wise men and Mary and Joseph respond to personal invitations, spiritually lost people respond to personal invitations, maybe more so than any other form of outreach. I get stuff in the mail all the time from different companies that say, hey, for X amount of dollars, we'll put together a glossy mail out. And you just canvas your zip code with, with glossy, multicolored cards, inviting them to come to your church. And I'm like, what? We got, we got, but you're, you're the postcard for this church. You are. And, and you are. You're, you're, you're the advertisement for this church. Your, your life, your words, your actions. And, and man, if you, if you and I personally invite people to, hey, would you join us at church? It's powerful. I want to tell you something about people who are spiritually lost and don't know Jesus Christ. Unless they're invited, they're, they're probably not going to show up for church. I don't know what it is. It's just not a thing where lost people wake up on Sunday mornings and think, I think I'll go to church today. But man, if somebody's invited them, and if they know somebody's going to meet them out front, somebody said, hey, we have a coffee cart out there too. Give you some free coffee. It's good. I apologize, by the way, to all of you who are looking for wassail this morning. That's not on me. That's on somebody else. Okay, so <laughs> personal invitations are powerful. When's the last time you invited someone to come to church with you? 
Last time you said to someone, I, I would love for you to be my guest of honor in church Sunday. I'll meet you. I'll, I'll take you out to lunch afterwards. Would you come? There's, there's some power in that. And you might have to ask more than once, but you keep asking. Look, someone who's spiritually lost, they don't know they're lost. That's why they don't wake up thinking about going to look for Jesus. And they have no clue as to the eternal danger they're facing because of their lostness. There were times <clears throat> um, when I would be down, there was this period of time where uh, I would go down hunting in, in the Ottomaha Swamp. And, you know, I, I was an adult now, and so I wasn't always hunting with my dad, and my boys were uh, just a little bit too young for me to... to feel comfortable going out in the swamp with them and guns in their hands. So, you know, there were times when I would just go and just, I like to stalk the woods, just walk through the woods. And, um, because, you know, there were some times when I got lost in those swamps. I don't know if you've ever been in a swamp, it's easy to get lost. I always had my compass with me so I could find my way out. But you know what, I was so stubborn because <coughs> once I realized I was lost, once I had come by the same tree, the same tree three different times, they had that big knot up there that looked like a little bear cub hugging on the side from a distance. About the third time around, then, then I think what? Okay, I think I'm going in circles here. <laughs> I'm lost. Do I immediately pull out my compass? You're right, I do not. Why not? Because John Wayne wouldn't have pulled out his compass. <laughs> He'd have found his way out. The sixth time I saw that bear cub, I thought, you know what? <clears throat> I don't know John Wayne. But I'm going to get my reading, find my way out. Lost people, they don't know they're lost. They just keep wandering. But man, the power of a personal invitation to come hear about Jesus, to come see what Jesus' people look like when they're in small group and when they're worshiping together. You see, the thing with a lot of lost people is they... they because they don't know. They just think that we're another club or another organization. They think you've got to have some kind of membership, you know, to be able to come here. Or you've got to dress a particular way. You, got, you know, they don't know. You know, we have a Rotary Club here in town. Who in here is a member of Rotary down here? Yeah. I don't just walk up there when the doors are open. I, I, I've gone when I've been invited. Every time I've been invited, I've gone... But I know I'm not a part of Rotary, the Rotary Club. So it's not like I just show up. And a lot of times, lost people that way at church, a personal invitation. Wow. Powerful. And then the last thing, because I know it's about time to go. It's just a challenge to all of us. And, and that is that uh, Christmas is a story worth telling. The shepherds talked about it. The wise men talked about it. People talked about it. And it's especially a, a story worth telling because it's really a story within a story. The Christmas story is a story within the bigger story of God's redemptive plan for humanity. And if you broke it down, if you broke down this, this, this incredible love story that God began all the way back at creation then basically act one would be the creation. Act two would be the rebellion of man when we rebelled against God's authority. Act three would be the first chosen of God. That would be through Abraham, the Jewish people. And we see all through the Old Testament how, how that worked. And then act four would be the, the, the first advent of Christ, Christmas, which led to the chosen, not the first chosen, that was the Jewish people, but the chosen, all those who received Christ. That's the church, the birth of the church. And then there's, there's a final act coming. I'm not going to break it down, but I'm just going to, there's a final act coming. It's called the second advent of Christ, the second coming of Christ. So Christmas, Christmas, there's, it's right here. And there's not a whole bunch to come after it. It means it's a story worth telling because it makes all the difference. Because Christmas leads to Calvary. Birth leads to crucifixion. The death of crucifixion leads to resurrection. And because he lives, you can live in Christ. It's a story worth telling. It's the only way to heaven.
It's the only way to be reconciled to your father. Let's be honest. You and I are going to talk about those things that are at the top of our passion list. We're going to do it. You are. Parents are going to talk about their children's accomplishments. A lot of them would be cyber chatting as they post over and over and over again of all that their child has accomplished at the age of three. Grandparents are going to talk about their grandchildren. At least that's what I hear. Because they're, they're, they're our passion. We love them. We love our children. We love our grandchildren. We're going, to, we're going to talk about an upcoming wedding, especially if it's our own or somebody that we know, somebody in our family, and <clears throat> we're going to make sure people see the ring, and, 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 and or we're going to talk about a new baby that's on the way, and that's an exciting thing, and that's a part of our passion. We get excited about that kind of stuff, or if we're building our forever house, or if we killed a trophy buck or caught a trophy fish, or if we win the lottery, but Christians don't play the lottery, but if we did win the lottery, we talk about those things. We'd be excited. We'd be juiced up about it. And I want to tell you that Christmas is worthy of that kind of passion because it's really the only story that matters. Is Christmas for you in the sense of God with us, Emmanuel, not in the sense of Santa or the movie Elf or trees or food or all those things, but is Christmas the most talked about of all your various passions? And if not, why not? You probably have had this sense as well, but you know, it used to be the old joke was people would come up with pictures of their grandchildren and they'd pull out their wallet. Now, now it's the phone. And man, they love to come up to you and say, oh, look, isn't he the most handsome thing? What are you going to say to that? Are you going to say, no, not really? Unless it's hard, he's going to have a whole hard, hard life unless his looks change. I mean, you're not going to say that? You know, if somebody comes up breaking out the pictures of the grandkids and the phone, or, or, you know, you're not going to say, you know, I'm really not interested. I don't want to see that. You're at least going to listen to what they say and what they show you. You know, generally speaking, people are the same way if you want to talk to them about Jesus. They may not be ready to receive him, but they're going to listen. I'm not talking about if you go up with a bullhorn and get in their face. I'm talking about if with the humility of Christ, you just say, can I tell you about Jesus? It's a story worth telling. I encourage you to tell it. And so, as a reminder of that, we're going to sing a hymn. It's hymn number 182. <clears throat> And this is, our, this is our closing prayer. When we're done singing, we'll be dismissed. I believe this hymn is Go Tell It on the Mountain. It is. And um, this is a story worth telling. So there's some things from the nativity that we can carry with us. Let's stand together as we sing.